Hello, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next um, 20 minutes is just, I suppose, provide some suggestions about um, the possibility of Gartner Krenna and Rath Crohan being linked um, just by outlining the various strands of evidence that we can apply to the area. So the quote that marks the uh, presentation itself comes from the Book of Leinster, um, the recension of the Thornbow Cullinia, which outlines the presence of four fords at a place called E, and I'll hope to uh, embark upon a, an understanding of what that might mean. So what I intend to do is uh, provide an indication of the geographical considerations before then providing a late Iron Age, um, I suppose, understanding of what my need more generally provides for us, and then follow that with a understanding of how one would get to Gertner Krana, and then just, I suppose, conclude. So from a geographical point of view, um, the small yellow star on the um, northeastern section of the map corresponds roughly with the uh, Gartner Krenna figure fine spot. The yellow dot, roughly central, is the Rathcrohan Mound um, location. So that's the focal point of the Rathcrohan landscape. Um, elevation wise, Rathcrohan Mound stands at, at the summit of a glacial plateau at 145 metres above sea level whereas Gutner Krana is roughly 66 metres above sea level. So initially, the two of them seem very different in terms of their location uh, and their local context. However, if we place um, Gartner Krana and Rath Kram within the wider territorial context, it may provide us um, some interesting insights. So the green um, territorial uh, boundaries that we see here are much later. They're based on the limits of Moini, which is a distinct territory around Midrus Common that is identifiable throughout the early medieval and later medieval periods. Uh, Moini or Mokra Connacht, these interchangeable set of names um, are first recorded, um, to my knowledge, um, in the Latin uh, Campum E in uh, Tyrakon's Collectiana of the 7th century. So combining Tyrakon's earliest, so, you know, re referring to events of possibly the 5th century in Tyrakon, you know, be it uh, historical or hagiographical, it doesn't really matter from our per perspective. It's the geographical context that's important for our purpose here. And co complementing that with the four fords of E that are referred to in um, the Lower Nahidra recension of the Thombo Kulinya, it's providing some neat insights. So if we take it as granted that the four fords of E, or at least three of them, are corresponding with the, um, the markings here. So down in the southwestern section, Ahmoga, Ahmoga is where Ballymo is on the River Suck today. Um, Oshlisson, which um, Eve has referred to earlier on, is uh, where Ballyshlisson Bridge is, um, very close by to where the Gartner Krenna fine spot is. And my own identification, um, subject to you know, uh, contradictory nature if necessary, um, of Ah Berkna, um seems to be consistent with the outskirts of Ballinagar in the northwestern section. So you can see it's neatly framed. OK, so this context of the, the territory of Moini. So just corresponding with that. So Moini or Mokra Connacht, the Plains of E or the Plains of Connacht are two terms used throughout the medieval period, both in historical and literary sources in order to define that part of Midras Common. This territorial name broadly corresponds with an area of high land use capability located immediately west of the River Shannon. Indeed, the only such significant area of high fertile land in Connacht. So it, this is River Shannon here. Excuse me, Sheikh. And that high land use capability is that large blob of emeraldy green that's just across the, the Shannon there. The, the yellow sinuous feature that's there is correspondent with Schlieve Bawn immediately to our east. So the Fords of E are this convention used in the Book of Leinster, Thombo, Cullinia, and they neatly define that space. So these Fords, despite the fact that it's a literary work, are physical locations and they are attested in other historical and literary sources. So indeed, Apertna appears in the Tombow Fligis as part of, uh, if, if we want to go into detail, a uh, brick cruise route to Bel Um So he crosses a river at Bel Nagar. And the uh, Kultna one, as, uh, as yet identi unidentifiable, is it possible that it's on or close to the Scrammog River? So while our earliest references are occurring in an epic tale to these Fords of E, this, this connected space, they are physical parts of the landscape. Um, and they would have been long standing parts of the landscape. So, as a result, it's highly likely that these river fords possessed an important role to the communities of late Iron Age, Moine. 
So this places Gorton of Cranda not only in the sphere of influence of Rathcrown and its immediate hinterland, but also situates the site only three, uh, three and a half kilometres to the west of the northeastern ford of Ashlissen. Therefore, we can conclude at this point that the Gorton of Cranda figure and the Gorton of Cranda sites more generally tell a significant story in attempting to understand Rathcrown and Moynee, so that territory. So the radiocarbon date, um, as Eve has outlined already, so the late Iron Age, requires us now to investigate what was happening at Rathcrohan and in the wider hinterland of Moynee at that same time. So the late Iron Age, I've defined it out into three broad categories. Um, we are scuppered in some respects by the lack of excavated evidence for large parts of this area. Obviously, a lot of that can be assisted by the infrastructure, the in advance excavations of the infrastructure works undertaken as part of the M5 realignment. So focusing initially on environment, and hopefully this will be um, either contradicted or supported through paleoenvironmental data that, as it comes um, becomes published. But the only insights that we can provide on what the environment may have looked like in the late Iron Age or early medieval period at present corresponds perhaps with townland names. So the townland system is in place by at least the 12th century. But there are suggestions amongst some scholars that these townland names and the divisions themselves may have been of considerable antiquity. So in the case of physical features on the landscape or physical parts of the landscape, it's quite possible that they're describing aspects of long standing value as, a as against the use of personal names or indeed um, dynasties names or surnames um, amongst pl uh, place names or townland names, which you can attribute then maybe to the taking over of land ownership. So physical features could, could be pointing to a, a long standing um, feature. So tellingly, the area between Rathcrohan Ridge and Gartner Crana um, is characterised by a predominance of woodland and wetland names surviving in the townlands. So you've got Ross Beg, Ross Moor, Ross Moor East, um, Gartner Crana, Killeen West and Creve, all woodland related um, townland names, all clustered around Gartner Crana fine spot itself. And then the wetland names are corresponding as you get closer towards the Rathcrohan Ridge. So as we see the red blob on the right and the left hand side of the image, that's above the 120 metre contour line, which is where the cluster of Rathcrohan's archaeology is located. As well as that, water up to the present day is notoriously difficult to acquire on the Rathcrohan Ridge. Ask any farmer out there, it's difficult to get water out there. Um, so as such, the springs that, inhabited the, uh, that inhabit the ridge are very well known and highly valued. We don't think about it in the same context in a modern sense, but water is so severely important um, for life. Uh, so the quality is likely to persist back to the early settler, settlers on the plateau. So that's just a neat kind of undertaking of what the environment um, may be able to tell us. So in terms of the field monuments, uh, the ability to conclusively date features in the area, as I've referred, is problematic at Rathcrohan because of the lack of excavation to date. However, the few dated sites coupled with uh, considerations of morphology, remote sensing surveys, as well as later literary evidence can help to inform the narrative of late Iron Age activity. So I broke, broke, broke them down into three categories. So burial and funerary monuments, to the ritual monuments and monumental architecture, to the suggestion of late prehistoric occupation at presumed early medieval settlement sites. So we have a LIDAR image of the core of the Rathcrohan area and even um, a, a cursory glance over it, you can start to see features um, dominating quite readily. So from the burial and funerary monument uh, category, the distribution of earthen burial mounds of various classes within the two most prominent archaeological complexes in Moynee, those being Rathcrohan, and Ard Keen, or the Cairns archaeological landscape, which is two kilometres immediately to the south of us. So we've got 37 recorded burial mounds at Rathcrohan. We've got 18 recorded burial mounds at Cairns. So obviously these categories of monument possess a very broad date range from the late Neolithic up until the historic period. However, a number of them would have been used, reused, modified both physically and in terms of their importance in the late Iron Age and beyond. Some examples include, but are not sole, the sole examples, Dahi's Mound, Dahi's Mound was excavated in 1981 by Professor John Modell from NUI Galway, and he returned a radiocarbon date range of a broad Iron Age date. Interesting enough, and then an aside, the red sandstone pillar that marks the graves is not of the local geology. So this is a limestone plateau and we've red sandstone. I task anyone to move a seven foot tall, four foot wide red sandstone pillar um, a distance. So there's a great effort involved in its construction and its placement there. Karen Fort is interesting as well. So Karen Fort a uh, rather degraded example of a barrow, um, but it's sitting alongside a D-shaped enclosure. And indeed, the summit of Cairn Fort also suggests evidence of a penannular depression 
uh, pointing over to the east, uh, suggested by Waddell as being a possible contest between the Christian church site down off the eastern slope and Carron Fort itself, the, the pre-existing monument. Also, there's a bull on stone um, uncovered on the surface there, um, possibly suggestive of ritual activity or indeed religious activity. So we see modification of these monuments through time. In the saga material, we have a whole litany of different uh, references to some of the burial mounds being attached to heroic figures, such as at Karen Free, Karen Akit, Karen Abrikna, and Karen Love. Again, showing an importance to the people of the time into the historic period, so even beyond the late Iron Age. And indeed, the Royal Ferta mentioned in the eastern slopes of Crook and in Tiracon's Collexiana. Um, seventh century texts meant to describe fifth century events, real or imagined, um, is still describing the placement of the elite into ancestral burial places, not in Christian context per se. It's important to note that. So this presents a strong case that in keeping with the literary attestation to Crookham as a great heathen cemetery, that these ridges were active and indeed famed as an elite necropolis in late prehistory and even eventually potentially up as far as the 8th century. And these are just some of the sites that were mentioned in that section there. In terms of ritual monuments, a lot of archaeologists in the room, Ritual, lovely word, isn't it? Um, it's very difficult to assign it. However, we can make some very broad strokes for the sake of the, the talk, at least. So we've owned a Goth cave, which is a natural limestone cavern, 37 metres long, seven metres at its deepest point. But our ancestors decided to attach an entrance to it in the early medieval period, possibly, maybe even earlier. Um, we're currently undergoing uranium thorium dating on a calcite deposit in the man-made section of the cave to see if we can provide a construction date for the passage itself. There are two ohm stones housed within its entrance as well. Um, it's replete with mythological and literary associations with being a, a location synonymous with the, an entrance to the Irish other world and also with the festivities surrounding the great prehistoric pre-Christian festival of Samhain, modern terms Halloween. So you could suggest there's ritual value placed upon that site. Alongside that, however, we also have through geophysical surveys undertaken by Brian Shanahan and the Discovery Programme in the early 2000s at Cairns. Cairns an ecclesiastical site, early medieval, later medieval evidence, also an ohm stone found there. But geophysical survey uncovered um, anomalies consistent with a figure of eight shaped structure with a bivalent enclosure surrounding it. And here's a reconstruction by Daniel Tish Tyler um, of what this first phase or er very early phase would may have looked like. There is a suggestion that these figure of eight shaped structures may have been part of a temple architecture for the late Iron Age. And we see that at various other locations across the island as well. In terms of monumental architecture, we're getting into the big stuff now. So late Iron Age is a particularly pronounced period of activity, we would argue, for Rathcrohan in terms of ceremonial activity and associated with mass assemblies of people. So we have huge undertakings of earth movement in the form perhaps of the Muklas, the muklas are a set of linear features, 100 metres long as the northern mukla and 3 metres tall at its maximum height. 275 metres in maximum length is the southern mukla, and that is more superficial in its height, as 1.5 metres as it currently stands. As you can appreciate, these are huge efforts of earth moving, huge amounts of community involvement in order to try and construct these features. Moreover, we can conceive of the 360 metre enclosure that surrounds Rathcrohan Mound. So what this enclosure entails is effectively a five metre wide dug ditch that surrounds the central focal point of Rathcrohan Mound. Five metres wide, deemed to be possibly a metre deep in depth and possibly rock cut in places. So this is again an enormous undertaking. Um, both monuments are feats of enormous labour and effort and may spell to the concept of these later, these early medieval descriptions of Einigi or great fairs or assemblies occurring at these focal points um, in the regional landscape. And I did an abstract calculation of how long it would take um, a group of 100 adults to dig the ditch. So it would take 56 days of continuous digging for a group to dig that ditch. Um, so a bit of effort involved in it. So you have to remember as well, in the late Iron Age, we're in a, a period in time in which our primary value in life is provision of food. So if you're moving the constituent parts of your community, the workforce, away from those aspects in order to engage in these huge ritual acts, it's for a level of importance and value that's been placed upon it. Moving further to the mound itself, the mound, an enormous feature, too deep in, in complexity for us to relay in any great detail today, but it's 88 metres wide, it's five and a half metres tall, and it's perched on the high point of the glacial plateau. Multi-method remote sensing survey uncovered all of that complexity. We're only going to look at the, the last phases of activity. So Rathcrohan Mound, 
A magnetic radiometry survey uncovered a series of features we saw them briefly a minute ago. So an avenue approaching it from the east to ploughed out burial mounds within that avenue, northern enclosure, avenue approaching that, enormous enclosure surrounding all of that. And some of these features are less than half a metre to three quarters of a metre below the ground, so very superficial. So the last phase of activity. And under undertaking those surveys and the results are speaking to a comparison, perhaps, perhaps with what was under, undertaken and uncovered through excavations at the likes of Navan Fort, particularly, but also at Knock All and the Hill of Tara. And indeed, that large enclosure is again something that's an attribute that we see it at these other great regional focal points. Focusing on the mound centre itself, one second now, um, enormous structure placed on its summit, uh, timber post holes roughly on average about 60 centimetres apiece, a 32 metre diameter structure, possibly roofed, possibly not roofed, but an enormous feature on the focal point and the, a very high vantage point as well. Uh, reconstruction drawing of what this may have looked like in late prehistory. A lot of late prehistorians in the room, so it's open to conjecture. Get your marker out of it if you want. That going. Um, in terms of late Iron Age, in terms of settlement activity, briefly, two sites were surveyed again through geophysical investigation. So um, Cashel Manonen down in the southwestern corner of the Rathcrohan Plateau uh, was surveyed by Roseanne Schott and by Joe Fennick and John Waddell. And what they uncovered was settlement continuity or what seems to be a long standing um, settlement activity at that site, um, preceding what we see in the in the above standing remains at Cashel Monon. And the same is true. Brian Shannon of the Discovery Pro Program undertook uh, similar surveys at Relignery. And again, they're demonstrating a suggestion of a long standing settlement at those particular focal points, um, probably elite settlement sites. So what can be concluded from the field monument evidence is that despite the paucity of evidence in terms of excavations, there's turning up ever an idea at least of elite burial ceremony, presumed large scale gatherings and probably high status settlement during the late Iron Age. In terms of material culture, again, no excavations. So we're pretty much um, basing ourselves upon um, certain discoveries and certainly from the 19th century. So domestic artifacts, there is currently 12 Rotary quern stones um, in farmers' possessions locally, um, including this nice decorated one. I won't tell you where it is. Um, mm. But that's speaking to arable farming, late Iron Age, early medieval. Um, we have equestrian related material, high status equestrian material in terms of the horse bits. Um, these were kindly provided to me, the two images on the left, um, by Rena Maguire um, as part of her recent publication. And indeed, we have a, a, a copper alloy mount with gold within it um, that's was found at Glen Valley Thomas, which is the next town land to the south of Rathcrohan Mound. And again, high status um, horse harnesses, displays of wealth, power, authority, etc. And then we have strange ritual, possibly ritual or ceremonial um, artifacts in the form of a stone lamp or censer, um, which is again housed in the museum display case in the, in the room next to us here. Um, and that was found also reputedly in the 19th century at the top of Rathcrohan Mound. Um, so as we close up, Research into overland routeways in early Ireland accentuates the position held by Rathcrohan as a focal point of Moynee in later prehistory and early historic period. We have this attested historical routeway of the Schlee Ossel, identified as a vital artery in this respect, and it terminates as a major routeway at Rathcrohan. However, in focusing on the overland route, perhaps water-based communication and movement of goods as it relates to Rathcrohan has been undervalued. So the stream sources of the Onyo River um, are locating themselves only a kilometre from the eastern slope of Rathcrohan. Uh, there are three wells that are referred and re preserved in the place names, the Tubber Rory, Tubber Crohar and Tubber Kia. They're marked by the, the triangles here on the left hand side. And they are part of the groundwater system also that the GSI has die traced um, to what becomes the Onio River. The course of the river is dotted by ring forts, some of which have names, and the early medieval church site of Champel Mile is just over a kilometre to the southwest of those headwaters. By way of understanding the potential use of this river in the past, even small rivers such as the Owen Yore, particularly in its pre-canalised form, would have been navigable, perhaps even as far back as its source to the east of Rathcrohan. Small boats, dugout canoes, coracles, and even one-person vessels constructed from rushes, believe it or not, um, have been employed on the small and large rivers of eastern Connacht into the 20th century, and indeed seven canoes were found on the Breed Oak River in the 1980s at French Park, very close by to us. 
Considerable loads can be transferred in this fashion, as indicated most recently with the installation of the Gertner Cranham figure replica in October 2021, and Colm can attest to it, as well as my poor staff here at Rathcrawan. So it took six of us, I believe, to take it down off the flatbed truck with straps. And some of these men are a lot bigger than I am. Um, I'm only a small person by comparison. Uh, yet it only took myself to float it down the river. By, it's four, it's four metres tall. It's as possibly a thousand kilograms in weight. It's possibly a ton in weight. So to move that piece, water-based, is a hell of a lot easier than it is by by terrestrial. So in terms of what the Owen River demonstrates to us, is this value that we're probably not looking at properly. Um, I also talk about an alternative source to the river, uh, to trade rather, um, via the Ogla River that runs past the visitor centre here. Um, but interestingly enough, the Ogla actually is met with Slieve Vaughan as an obstacle. And I, the Owen Yore actually ends up going into um, the River Shannon at Loch Bodurg through a complex series of small ribbon lakes, albeit, but it's a lot more accessible than the Ogla, which is beside us here. So the catalogue of evidence outlined above seems to indicate two things. Gertner Cranham was operating within the heartland, the hinterland of Rathcran. So they're linked, I believe, in symbolic and ceremonial um, fashion. While the Gertner Cranham figure was standing and was in significance to the communities who interacted with it during the late Iron Age, Rathcran was also seeming to be at its height in its physical importance. Therefore, spatially, chronologically, a connection existed between the activities of Gertner Cranham and Rathcran, and it could be posited that complementary ritual and ceremonial events may have taken place at both. However, alongside the ritual component, it's possible to suggest that the activity on the Rathcrohan Plateau, be it ritual, domestic or elite residential in form, may have been supplied to from the River Shannon by the River Rhine route of the Oanyor. Equally so, people and commodities may have progressed east to the Shannon and the wider world from Rathcrohan, floating underneath the looming shadow of Gertner Crana in the process, maybe echoing some of what Ross was, ta Ross was talking about in terms of the transfer of these very important high status artefacts and that are turning up on site. So with that, I'll say bye.